Um, and I recently met this company and fell in love with them. They're doing just awesome stuff in terms of, again, making product, right? So Janice talked earlier about, hey, the different ways of making products, and we see massive innovation there, and she sort of called for additional innovation. Welcome, Ashley, how are you? Nice to see you Great. again. Great to see you as well. Um, and so you're with Red Clay, yes. uh, and you've been doing this for a couple of years now. Explain to everybody in a sentence. Sure, well, what? we really, uh, we set out to build Red Clay to make exceptional products, and we do that by connecting freelance designers and brands, and then offering software that goes from idea to production. Got it. So you want to make better products in the world, and the world wants better products. Yes. The world's becoming very design-driven. I mean, it's pretty amazing, just 20 years ago, how many different salad bowls were there compared to today, where mm -hmm. our expectation is, if I type in orange, you know, salad bowl made of plastic, I should have five options. Yes, and then also the shift to usability. So the focus really on the, the consumer as well and how we, yeah, how we are designing. All right, so let's take a look at the product and how it works. Um, yeah. Let me uh, pull up our deck and you can show how red clay works. Do you guys have the deck? Maybe. There, there it we goes. go. Okay. Um, so this is one of our designers. This is um, Max um, PTK out of the Ukraine. And so this is kind of set up to show you how the process works. And we're going to walk through a project that was re recently on the platform um, with an engineering team out of Life Assist. And Life Assist, um, are, they're awesome engineers. And they had everything um, for the technology side of this watch, but they didn't have the design. So they came to the platform to um, fulfill that need for a design. So Life Assist we would all know based upon the hilariously inappropriate commercials where mm -hmm. an old lady falls down and says, help, I've fallen and I can't get mm -hmm. up. Like we just... Yes, now, those it's, now, it's, now it's on your wrist. Okay, yeah. so and help, aids, I've fallen, I can't get up. It aids senior citizens. Yes. So Life Assist came to the Red Clay platform and they were prompted through a design brief, um, through multiple questions of those really specifications that they needed for the watch, um, colors, manufacturing um, specifications. And then once they were complete with that, that's pushed out to the Red Clay design community. Um, there's about 500 industrial and freelance designers that are a part of the community, which have all been vetted. And those designers, once that brief is pushed, can say, yes, I'd really like to be a part of this uh, project, or no, it's not a fit for me, or I don't have time to participate right now. And for this Life Assist project specifically, these are the designers that um, said, yes, I'm willing to work on this project. And then from there, there's an algorithm that matches those designers that would be the best fit for, for the brand. So you're essentially run, running a bake-off, a design contest. Yes, a challenge. A challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and typically, Life Alert would hire some high-priced design firm yes. to do this. Mm -hmm. and get one or two designers working on the project? Yeah, typically they'd usually work, and there are startups, they would probably work with a design firm that had maybe two to three designers. And that usually costs about twenty to $30,000. And that's, you know, a cap and can go much further up with their three visions. And, um, and they're usually getting, yes, two to three to four concepts that they can, can run with. Okay, and so what happened on Red Clay when you did and, this contest? Yeah, and so these are, this is um, another designer that was matched to the project, uh, David, and um, uh, another one as well. And, and these are, uh, lots of the images you're seeing are projects that have actually come through the platform and the work that they've done for the platform. So this was the actual watch that was eventually created? This is not it. This was just one of the ideas that came through. Oh, so this is an idea that came through mm -hmm. of, hey, this is how this should look. Yeah, and so these are actually, this will kind of be a video of showing, each designer is required to submit five unique concepts. So for this project, there were five designers. Sometimes um, brands will use five designers, 10 designers, and that gives them a more range of products. And for this project, there were 25 designs that were submitted. 25 um, designs from mm -hmm. five designers, five designs each. Correct. And then the winner gets paid, the other people don't get paid? <laughs> Everyone gets paid. So everybody gets paid? Yes. So this isn't like the 99 designs, um, everybody works for free, and then maybe somebody gets a pittance for the logo. 
um, which is highly controversial. They call that spec yeah. work, I think, in your business. That's correct. Yeah. And so any designer who's chosen to work on the project, and that's pretty much a brand seen on the platform, that these are the test 10 best designers for my project. And they say, yes, I'd like to move forward with these. And the moment those designers move forward, they're paid every step of the way. So you pay designers every step of the way. There's yeah. no freebies. So you're not going to get a free ride doing this as a life alert. But you are getting 25 designs instead of three or four. Yes. When working with five designers, you receive about 25 designs. If you're working with 10 designers, you receive about 50 designs. So what do I do with the 25 designs? Like, my God, there's so many to go through. This is something that you normally wouldn't have this issue of abundance, right? True. And yeah. so it kind of works like a modal swipe. So you can kind of swipe through the designs and say, yes, no, I like this, I don't like this. And then from there, the ones that you really like as a brand and feel that it fits your vision of the design brief, you can move forward with those and that moves into the revision phase. And that's where um, there's modals also that prompt you to give feedback on those designs, which is, oh, let's shift the color or we need to change angles for manufacturing. And in that phase, the, the designers have about a week to two weeks to adjust those revisions for the uh, for the brand. So you narrow down from five to two maybe, mm -hmm. and then they get paid a different amount. And so the three people who get cut, they get paid something, and then do they own their designs? They do. They own their designs. The only time that um, it would the ownership would move to the brand is if it's selected and they're compensated for that. Ah. And they're usually compensated in cash, pending on the category, or cash and a royalty of that product. Got it. And so these are actually the, um, the watches that were chosen for revisions. So each designer went through and shifted some of the colors and just ensuring that this is a requirement of two batteries. It had to have a speaker. And sometimes that was even missed, so they went back and kind of um, revised that. So there's a double battery, one on either side. So mm -hmm. if one battery goes down, yes, grandma's going to be okay. Yes, back up. Um, and here we go. So this is this how is many contests you've done? Yeah, this is actually how many products that we've done. And so 70 in 2013 that have run through the platform. We'll hit about 100 by the end of the month. And then this is showing um, you know, what designers can make from that and what they'll make each year. So, and, it, and that's underestimated. There could be a product like the Crocs or Tom's that just go crazy and those royalties go up. How does this licensing work? Because I wasn't aware of this until mm -hmm. we met, mm -hmm. but I had no idea that product designers got um, uh, a license. Yes. How does that work? So they license it out. It's a rev share usually. So it's usually um, they're compensated upfront, similar to how Red Clay compensates upfront for the dis initial design work and then also the revision work. And then usually it's a one, two, three percent royalty, and that's depending on the category. Some furniture versus packaging or other products vary in those percentages, and the contracts vary as well. You know, they can be anywhere from a year to two years, and sometimes even five years. Um, five years of royalties. Yes. So what is the most a designer makes? Like what is somebody who designs one of those beautiful like Eve Bahar chairs or something mm -hmm. like a sail chair or you know some of those kind of things we'd all recognize an Arion chair or whatever. Yes, um, that's a great example. The Yves Bahar chair, um, wildly successful. Um, anywhere three to five million dollars a year in wow. royalties for that product. In royalties, not the top line, but the royalties. And that, yeah, that's just royalties, and that's one product. Royalties on one product. Mm -hmm. And then you think greeting cards for the Fortune 10 companies. And those are ranging, just for one greeting card, $80,000. $80,000 in royalties over the life of the greeting card. Yes. And wow. And one designer, one greeting card, that's a pretty great year. And the reason why they don't just pay designers a larger fee up front is because they don't want to spend the money or the designers have just become savvy and it's been a competitive marketplace. Like, I'm just curious, how does yeah. royalties ever cement itself as the standard? Well, it's interesting. I was learning up on it too when I first um, stepped into it. Um, my background's actually in architecture and we it was cash up front and yeah. cash when you completed the project, uh, no royalties. And it was more the idea of we're all in this together. Ah. You create a great product, 
we'll sell that great product and we'll do a rev share on that. And this is one of the products as well? Yeah, actually this is um, Dillard's department store. It says um, Bill Dillard's the third was the first one to use the platform. They yeah. ran it through, um, they really engaged your consumer actually too in marketing. And um, these products sold out um, within the first five weeks. So these Sold are out. ones you're actually looking at that have been in our homes and we yeah, yeah, still, yes, yeah, so we still have. And um, yeah, and they saw in the other products uh, five times sell through rates. They usually mark down their products within the first week. Um, their customers used to that uh, marking down and um, five weeks until they actually marked it down. And, and um, yeah, some more products. Yeah, so we yeah, so we actually. Um, before we started working with Dillard's, um, we were actually using the process and the platform to create products for red clay. Ah, and so you saw yourself as a quirky or as a target yourself. Yeah, so we would actually have the red clay branded products. So and you built this process to build a store with products in it, and then you yeah. realized that your actual product was the process. Exactly, and we realized it was, my co-founder called me one day and she's like, hey, I'm gonna do a marketing ploy. I bought um, a 1977 Airstream and I restored it and I'm just gonna do pop-up shops around the country. It's like, awesome, I got line items for um, buffer on my um, on our financial statements for Airstream buffers for yeah. convenience and whatnot, and um, it had made front page of the Arkansas newspaper in especially in Bentonville, Arkansas, where um, some of the largest manufacturers, white label manufacturers, are. And uh, the next day, they started calling us and saying, "Hey, can you actually do this for us?" Ah. And we kept hearing that, and that's the transition and where we were. Yeah. So, are yeah. there more products to see here, or? Um, this is another one. Um, uh, one of our designers out to Paris. This is a landscape um, image um, that she's been working with. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, and so, we, where is this all going? I mean, if you succeed in the next five or ten years, because you get a cut of the license mm -hmm. and you yes. get a cut of the revenue. Yes. Um, so. Would I look at your company like a holding company of like a mutual fund of licenses of amazing designs? Or would mm -hmm. I, how do I look at your company? Because it's a kind of a new mm -hmm. model that I, I haven't heard before. It is. Today you could look at it like that and you can look at it like that because we chose to become laser focused and achieve this first. And then we see so many different avenues that we can go, um, especially with 3D printing popping up. I mean, when you think ah. about it, you look at all these designs that you saw and we call them the best leftovers. And we start thinking, well, the only reason that the brand didn't necessarily choose to use them is because it wasn't a fit for their brand. But mm. what about other people? And we start to see a marketplace for that and then lending to 3D printing. And, and even more so involving the consumer as well. Ah, so the, the other 23 watches, Swatch Watch mm -hmm. might be interested in one of them, or Rolex or somebody else who is not competitive, or people might want to 3D print certain things. Do you think that yeah. 3D printing is going to work? Is that going to be like a phenomenon? I really do. I think that you and I will have 3D printers in our house and I can go onto red clay and I can look for a hammer that I need and I can print it at the house and use it. When do you think it'll actually be useful? Because right now it's trinkets and toys it and is. hobbyists. Mm -hmm. But how far are we from like actually fabricating stuff in our homes that we would actually need or want? Quicker than I thought. I was just at uh, CCA and I was working with them in the Innovation Lab. It's the Graduate Design School in California. And their team is cranking out, they're actually building the 3D printers in three weeks. And they're pushing it even further and printing with clay. So they're actually printing 3D mugs. And so that makes me think that it's going to be even even quicker than I had originally. So a couple of years from now maybe? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think it's like 10 years out. I think they gotta think? figure it out. Although I did see a Nutella printer and I did think like, if I could start printing Nutella, you know, like the spread, mm -hmm. I would probably do that every day. <laughs> you know, like with my daughter, I'd be like, let's print a flower Nutella, any excuse to eat Nutella. But it sure. does seem like people are like the chocolate one or the mm -hmm. Nutella one or icing or making cakes. Like this all of a sudden becomes like super useful on a daily basis. Oh, sure. And then you think about, um, you know, just having a dollhouse and then your daughter being able to design that and print yeah. out the items for that. So I think that's even more exciting when you talk about exciting of design of your daughter being able to be empowered. To actually like make and design stuff. And, yeah. Um, okay, so let's do some questions. Uh, people must have questions about this process. Who, who are some of the biggest brands that have used it, by the way, while we're getting a question from the audience? Uh, well, we have about um, 
five Fortune 10 companies. So Fortune 10? Yes. Not, one, not 500, not 100, 10. 10. So we're seeing it in the enterprise all the way to startups like we did wow. with Solve Life Assist. So it's 20K maybe to run a contest, 10K? What does it cost? Yeah, it's um, anywhere from $6,500, which is graphic, um, all the way up to $15,000, which starts to dabble in collections. And so if I was going to do a Kickstarter because I wanted to create some new item mm -hmm. that should exist in the world, I could actually go to Red Clay first, do a design process, get all those models, mm -hmm and then launch a Kickstarter to actually bring it into the world. So I don't know if you saw Jana speak earlier today. I did, yeah. I mean, it must have been very exciting for you to see mm -hmm. the people building brands around testing products in the market. Mm -hmm. Do you think sometimes like, oh, maybe we should add a crowdfunding component to this and just do like, hey, let's all make the perfect uh, decanter yes. design and then let the audience vote. And if they want to fund it, put the minimum required mm -hmm. to fund it. Exactly. We're having customers start to say that, and so we're keeping a tally. <laughs> if we get to a certain amount, that probably makes more sense for us to start implementing those features. But we're starting to beta test some of that as well. And what do the designers think of this? Obviously, someone like Eve Bahar, who we both know, like mm -hmm. he is going to be spoken for and busy for the rest of his life at this point. Mm -hmm. But are, are these like out of school designers or are these like serious professional designers? What's the range? Are these, because I would think people who were whatever, 20 or 30 years into their career, mm -hmm. would they look down on having to compete to be the one selected mm -hmm. and be like, well, that's, I don't compete. I'm a 50 year old designer. I, I designed this bowl. Why mm -hmm. should I compete? Yeah, so we have designers who are graduating from design school who are working on the platform and building their portfolio, their own studio. It's a way to really access work. And then we have designers all the way up to Sebastian Scherer, who just won the Lexus Design Award of the Year. And then I have a great mentor at IDEO who says, well, I, I am not designing anymore. I'm an industrial designer, and I am designing at IDEO, but I don't actually get to work on projects anymore. So what about just doing some one-day projects where I could actually participate and you know do what I love to do and this platform allows for that it allows you really just to focus on design none of the business what's this what's the story with copyright and trademarks in design because mm -hmm. the, I'm also fascinated by the intellectual property mm -hmm. that goes on here you sort of start this contest which started with a brief mm -hmm. which means they own the brief and then a bunch of designers interpreted the brief mm -hmm. and made something so is that a derivative product of the brief and does the person who wrote the brief own some of that? And then somebody may have given feedback, so then who owns that idea? And it reverts back to their ownership if they don't get selected. Mm -hmm. How does all that work? It seems very murky. Yeah, right now the, um, the designer owns all of their designs unless they're purchased, right. unless that license goes into agreement. And the brand owns all of their intellectual property. And a brand can choose um, to be private or public. Most brands today choose to be private. So you'll see as you get on the platform, you actually sign in and you have to be a part of the community to see what's actually all going on behind the scenes. Kind of see it as a virtual studio. Ah, so people are doing this discreetly. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it, does it result in products that are more unique or does it just result in a more efficient product creation cycle? I, both, because um, it is efficient. Um, we can run a project from ideation to production in six weeks, huh. which sometimes that can take up to 18 months. And then we're also seeing that with a more wide range of designers that they are getting more fresh designs and unique concepts, especially because we have designers who are um, about, it's 40% international and 60% domestic. So ah. we need a new perspective as well. Now what about um, fashion? Because there's a line like, because you have fashion designers, right? Uh, Ms. Rahi is like, I'm going to do my own kitchenware, but mm -hmm. I thought he was doing couture or whatever. Mm -hmm. So people seem to be blurring the lines as designers. Like, do you think you'll go into fashion and say, like, hey, we want to make a, you know, new cargo short, mm -hmm. you know, for guys, and mm -hmm. we want you to help design the new cargo shorts? kind yeah. of situation or sundresses or whatever? Yeah. yeah, we see that as a great option to scale, to go more um, vertical versus horizontal and a way to not only to do fashion, but the medical industry. Um, my oh, the medical industry? Yes, that really excites me. And my, my co-founder even sees it further in policy. 
you know, it really is bringing people together to solve problems and creating these communities of really smart people to be able to share their time and knowledge to really make that exceptional idea. Let's take a question. Ashley, that was awesome. I think it's a great Thank platform. You. Thank you. My question's around the intellectual property that Jason was talking about. So I, I go on the platform, I want a product designed, and I pick maybe two of the final five. What's to stop the other three because I didn't purchase their product to sell that and compete directly with me in the market with a, because they're probably good designs as well, just not, mm -hmm. didn't fit my need, but now they're free to go sell that design to somebody? In 90 days, they can sell it to somebody. So you as the brand still has 90 days option to be able to purchase those other designs. And if you choose at those 90 days not to purchase those, then in the rights all go back to the brand and they can, or the designer, and they can choose what they want to do with it. It seems fair. And it, do they buy it to kill it sometimes? Like just to buy it so it's not on the market? So it's almost like a kill fee? It is. Huh. Mm -hmm. So they're just like, here's a thousand bucks, we're going to take your baby and lock it up. Yeah, you see it a lot in the trade show industry. Uh, when people come and they maybe see a poster or a print or a pattern, huh. they'll not only print, um, buy, purchase one, but all the other ones that they feel that maybe someone, a competitor may purchase. Ah, so it's a blocking strategy. It is. A and so what do you think this business looks like in 10 years if you succeed? Have you um, thought about that? I have. Uh, I think it's the larger vision is bringing people together to solve problems. Huh. So that could be, I mean, what's the craziest, it, it, what's the craziest problem you would solve that would make you go, we're done, like, we, we, we accomplished the mission. You know, you solve this problem, we're... Yeah, I think it's two. I think, um, you know, my half, uh, which is the excitement to the medical industry and mm. really being able to make medical leaps um, uh. with the platform we allow and really bringing those people together. And then the other half is my co-founder's half, which is the policy side and really uh. making a shift. So there's some medical challenge you would love to see solved. Yes. Do you have a particular one? I mean, it's easy to say cancer or something, but is cool. there something like that would, an actual product? I, I would see a success if we could even do it in any area. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating like to think you have more collaboration mm -hmm. and more prizes. In a way, do people compare it to the XPRIZE projects? I mean, there's not like a purse. There's sort of payment going on, but... You know, I haven't heard that yet. Yeah. Yeah. It is interesting because one of the things they found with the XPRIZE, mm -hmm. or Peter Diamantes mm -hmm. told me, was they needed to get funding for people along the way. Mm -hmm. Because the, so giving like a $10 million prize to get to the moon, kind of unrealistic. Mm -hmm. Better to give like a $250, a million dollar prize to four people mm -hmm. who get to a certain stage, who fund themselves, to then compete for $6 million mm -hmm. to get to the moon, right? Mm -hmm. So you're sort of giving tranches of funding, which is what I love about your ideas. The, the, five develop, the five designers get, what, $1,000 each, $500 each for the initials? For the initials. For each phase, it's anywhere from $250 to $500. Right. So they're looking at, you know, $1,500, $2,000 in cash just for participating. Right. So they participate and they get $1,500, which is great. Yeah. You know, the car payment yeah. or vacation or whatever. And then, yeah. boom, if they win, they get the other ten k Exactly. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a wonderful vision. Continued success with it. And let's hear it for Ashley from Red Clay.